I want to welcome everyone to a webinar with uh, Marushka Svashek uh, from Queen's University Belfast. I am John Connolly, the director of the Institute for, of Slavic, East European and Eurasian Studies. And so I'll say a few words of introduction um, and then Marushka will um, give her talk. Um, so Marushka is a professor of anthropology at Queen's University Belfast and fellow of the Senator George J. Mitchell Institute for Global Peace, Security and Justice. Her main research interests include migration, artifacts, politics and emotions. In the last 10 years, her work has brought these trends together, exploring the effective relationality of humans, artifacts and spaces in an era of globalization. At present, she's working on a book on art and politics of visibility in Czechoslovakia, the Czech Republic, and investigating the effects of the coronavirus pandemic on the lives of migrant women in Ireland. Her publications include Ethnographies of Movement, Soci so Sociality and Space, Placemaking in the New Northern Ireland, uh, that's 2018, Creativity and Transition, Politics and Aesthetics of Cultural Production Across the Globe, 2016, Emotions and Human Mobility, Ethnographies of Movement, that's 2012, uh, and Post-Socialism, Politics and Emotions in Central Europe, um, 2006. Um, I'll note one, one work that I particularly value uh, that's not listed on Marushka's official uh, CV is her work from the 1990s entitled Style, Struggles and Careers and the Ethnography of the Czech Art World, 1948 to 1992, which is a for me a really superb, outstanding uh, work of, of both history, or well, sort of oral history, um, analysis, anthropology, that uh, is, is a hallmark um, important work in um, the little understood history of Eastern, East Central Europe, as well as the Czech, Czech lands. Um, and today, Marushka will speak to us on Czech art and the politics of invisibility, articulations of suffering and defiance. So without further ado, Marushka, the floor is yours. Thank you, John, for the kind introduction and also for inviting me here. So I'm very happy to be actually in Berkeley, although on Zoom, but I have met a few people. Uh, so uh, anyway, uh, here we go then. Um, what I would like to do in this presentation is to introduce some thoughts around transvision, uh, visibility and politics that I'm developing in a book I have been working on for some time. The monograph, um, is partly based on my PhD research on Czech art and politics, 1940 to 1992, that covered 40 years of communist censorship and transformations during the first three years after the 1989 Velvet Revolution. And you can see here also some, some other publications that came out at the time. Now in 2017, I returned to the field and have since stretched the historical research focus, which now starts in the 19th century and ends in the present day. So you see here some, uh, um, uh, uh, some publications coming out that have come out, um, but more uh, will come. Now, maybe also important is that uh, my work in between has also developed and actually my, my focus at the moment is very much also influenced by my other work, for example, on um, art and cultural production, on uh, transition and transformation of people and things, um, on emotions and affect, and also on politics and emotions in post-socialist uh, Europe. So my aim uh, in this presentation is twofold. I will outline the basic assumptions of the perspective of transvision and introduce you to a couple of artists and some of their works. I will argue for the usefulness of transvision as analytical tool to investigate artistic articulation as a dynamic process of movement. So this is work in progress. So I'm, I would very much um, welcome any comments and critical questions. So my basic pr premise is that human life is defined by movement. One of the aspects I focus on is time, so on temporal movement. Not only coevalness in shared historical time, but also as backward and forward movement within and between different temporalities. When exploring art production, this demands an exploration of career paths in changing political contexts, of memory and anticipation, 
of ritual process and temporal circularity, and of claims to timelessness and transformation. In terms of space, I'm interested in spatial movements within and between concrete locations, and in spatial processes that create, reinforce, and destabilize notions of place, territoriality, and placed belonging. Also included is a focus on spatial movement in virtual space through digital mediation. In terms of physical, physicality, life is impossible, of course, without movement through um, our embodied and placed existence and movement, and also uh, mortality, uh, entanglement with the environment, sensorial and affective relationality, and so on. And focusing on materiality, movement is also key. People produce and interact with existing and emerging material realities. This implies that humans are effectively entangled with material environments through concrete and placed encounters and engagement. And of course, material objects and pictures move and are moved across temporal, spatiotemporal, and social context, thus gaining and losing situationally specific meanings, efficacy, and value. So finally, thinking through performativity, one can identify a variety of staged and unstaged actions and explore movements between public and hidden performative fields. And in those fields, individual, social, and political cells are performed. So within this framework, framework of movement, the perspective of transvision explores all sorts of interrelated dynamics of seen and being seen, of the production and framing of visual knowledge and ideologies, of enskillment, performativity, and spectacle. And particularly thinking about the processes of making, it investigates dynamics of internalized visions, visual imagination, and material expression and articulation. Crucial is, of course, that transvisionary mo movements are not automatic or smooth. They happen within fields of tensions. They are shaped by regimes and contradictions of taste. They're influenced by politics of censorship and influenced by shifting boundaries and blockages between conscious and unconscious knowing. So in this presentation, I focus particularly on visual articulations of suffering and defiance in relation to totalitarian regimes. So let me introduce you to 75-year-old Jerzy Sozansky, who was born in 1946. I first met him in October 2018 in the gallery of the Central Bohemian region in Kutna Hora. And this was during the launch of the catalog States of Mind, Beyond the Image, produced for the new permanent exhibition of the collection. I had received an invitation a year, year earlier as one of the contributors to the catalogue. And my essay entitled Museum Encounters, People, Things, Affective, Affective, Affective Spaces, included a discussion of Sozansky's work, Rising Above, Posnesheni, made in 2014. So here you see um, the um, curator, um, Drury, who is in fact, an English, uh, sorry, he's, he's actually a Scottish person from Britain and who has been in the Czech Republic uh, for 30 years. So you can see here that um, Drury is um, showing the triptych um, by Sozansky actively interpreting the work through verbal explanation. And this, of course, means that he would uh, that that the, the the work itself has been taken from Sozansky's studio and has been spatially and ideologically reframed within the context of the exhibition. So the triptych uh, constitutes three ver vertical panels that each show the same fragmented naked body. The work alludes to Jan Palach a Czech philosophy student who set himself alight in 1969 in protest against the invasion of Czechoslovakia by the Warsaw Pact armies. This invasion led to normalization politics that made an end to a more liberal version of state socialism. A cast of Palach's uh, death mask, 
secretly taken by the sculptor Obram Zobek and reproduced by Sozansky in 2014, is attached to the middle panel. The imprint of his burnt face indexes Palach's uh, tragic death, confronting visitors with visible traces of his bodily suffering. Its material presence simultaneously emphasizes and defies the passage of time. While Palach died over 50 years ago, his agony can be seen right in front of us through artistic artic articulation. The fact that the material reference to his self-immolation is on public display is also an index of a political transformation that has allowed movement from backstage to front stage performance. In 1969, Zobeck publicly displayed one of the casts on the location of Palach's sacrificial act at Wenceslas Square, where people gathered to mourn Palach's death. After normalization politics tightened, however, public references to Palach were no longer allowed and disappeared from the public realm. Officials also removed his gravestone and exhumed his corpse from the graveyard in Prague, which had become a site of pilgrimage and quiet resistance. So the death mask stayed out of sight in Zobek's studio till 1989, when Palach was officially reframed as a symbol of victory over communism and heroic suffering for the Czech nation. Zobek used it to create a bronze memorial, which was unveiled at the philosophy faculty in 1990. Students gather uh, annually to commemorate his death on the day of his self-sacrifice, creating a sense of temporal circularity, reinforcing a vision of democracy and freedom. Now, the annual commemorations of his tragic death also remind the public of a very physical form of suffering, as you can see here. But let us return to Sozansky's work, Rising Above, and look at the visual elements that he incorporated in his work. So apart from the death mask, textual elements produce a painful presence. The words from an official police report printed on the left and right panels of the work list the items that Palach carried with him at the time of his act. Most are mundane objects, a movie ticket, a university canteen card, reminding viewers that Palach was a young student in his prime. And this shows how words invoke visual images that presented to, in this case, an art loving audience can produce shock and empathy. So when I meet Sozansky, he tells me that he himself was deeply shocked by Palach's uh, suicide, a feeling that has stayed with him throughout his life. Then in 1970, he got to know Zobek, who let him work in his studio. The death mask hung on the wall, and the plaster model of Jan Palach's gravestone stood next to it. So then in 2007, Zobek gave the death mask to Sozansky to use in his own work but it took several years for Sozansky to actually start working with it. Now, human suffering has remained a central theme to Sozansky's work for the past 50 years. Um, he has reacted to war and oppression in different historical and spatial contexts, uh, thus linking, uh, creating links and looking backwards and forwards across different times, spaces and conflicts. His exhibition, Extreme Situations, in 2015, created a visual link between these various moments and conditions of suffering uh, and resistance. The fact that it was opened in the year of the 17th, uh, 17th anniversary of the end of the Second World War and the 20th anniversary of the end of the war in former Yugoslavia, where he also did some work, uh, interlinked different ritual circularities. In the catalog, curator Richard Drury wrote that, uh, I quote, in his work, the painter and sculptor Jerzy Sozansky uses the language of the struggle, the fight, pressure and counter pressure to express the historically specific and eternal theme of the collapse of moral order, uh, sorry, of moral orders and lightened values in whose place there emerges the frenzied execution ground of conscience. So the term eternal suggests a notion of uh, a timeless morality or moral issue. 
Cruelty during the Second World War has been a recurrent theme in Swazanski's work since 1976. He has created and exhibited numerous works in the small fortress in Theresienstadt, in Czech known as Terezin, uh, like this statue of a naked man in a pose that reminds us of the crucified Jesus and that suggests both vulnerability and defiance. The small fortress um, was, uh, or Mala Pevnost, or Kleine Festung, was established in the late 18th century by Emperor Joseph II of Austria and named in honor of his mother, Empress Maria Theresa. And here on this ticket, you can see uh, the small fortress on the, on the right and then the larger fortress on the, on the left. And here you can see also that this is, uh, has become a space of um, a commemoration and also tourist interest. Uh, and uh, you see somebody here, a guide uh, showing uh, several uh, parts of, of, of the, the fortress. From June 1940 40, until May 1945, the German Gestapo used the small fortress to imprison political opponents. And in total, around 32,000 people, including 5,000 women, were incarcerated and prisoners were used as slave labor. Around 2,600 uh, prisoners died in the fortress as a result of hunger, torture, and poor hygiene. Over 250 prisoners were executed and thousands died after transpor transportation to uh, concentration camps. In 1941, the Nazis turned the nearby town of Terezin into a Jewish ghetto, and 90,000 of the 140,000 Jews who stayed there in the three and a half years of its existence were deported to forced labor camps and extermination camps. And in the ghetto itself, um, 33,000 people died, mostly from disease or starvation. So for Sozansky, the small fortress, um, um, he, he chose a small fortress to work in and reflect on these horrors. And you see here a first exhibition from 1976. And here we see in 1980, he returned with six other artists to create and uh, paintings and installations uh, in response to this history of cruelty. So one of the artists uh, so here's another, uh, you see them at work and some of the, the resulting, uh, in this case, paintings and, and installations. Now, one of the artists uh, was Ivan Bukowski, whose Jewish parents had met in the Terezin ghetto. They survived Auschwitz, Ravensbrück and Bergen-Belsen. And of course, Bukowski's perception of the site and his resulting words works were influenced by this traumatic family history. Soon after the opening of the exhibition in 1980, the Ministry of Culture, of course, this was communist times, uh, closed it and destroyed all the works. Uh, the artworks did not reflect the communist vision of art, so had to dis disappear from public space. So this is again an example of movement in the many different, uh, at many different levels. In Sozansky's words, the censors took, uh, I quote, the exhibition as an intervention in stable orders, where everything had its place and where everything that did not agree with this so-called order was reprehensible and had to be persecuted, uprooted, and forbidden, unquote. In 2021, an exhibition entitled The Fortress, or Pevnost, presented photo documentation of the destroyed works, combining it with quotes by influential thinkers who have written about totalitarian regimes, truth, and violence, such as Václav Havel, Jan Patochka, and Hannah Arendt. The perspective of transvision emphasizes how past activities can be revisited, reviewed, and visually and materially revived in present contexts. As such, they do not only index um, past censorship and defiance, but also represent and perform current concerns and visions. So let us now turn to 92-year-old Czech Jewish artist uh, Helga Hoshkova Weisova, who is a survivor of Terezin, Auschwitz, and Flossenbürg labor camp. 
She's most of all known for the drawings and paintings she made as a child in Terezin between the ages of 12 and 15, and her diary, in which she reports her experiences of the Holocaust. When she arrived in Terezin, her first painting that she gifted to her father was an innocent scene depicting two children playing with a snowman. See that here on the left hand side. Her father instructed her instead to paint what you see. So she began documenting the hardships uh, of life in Terezin. Uh, these were also hidden by the Nazis, by the way, to the outside world when they quickly beautified the camp before a visit by the Red Cross uh, during uh, the Second World War. So this brings another aspect of transvision to the fore, the movement between off-stage and on-stage realities. When Helga was put on transport to Auschwitz, a friend uh, hid her drawings and a diary behind the wall. Um, and they, those reappeared uh, after uh, liber liberation. Reproduced in books and online, they offer visual impressions of past suffering and courage. The artist uses them when she is invited to talk to children and adults all over the world, to warn them against the dangers and moral consequences of discrimination and hatred. After the war in 1950, she applied to the Academy of Applied Arts in Prague to study painting. And this was, of course, 1950, the Stalinist period. While she was accepted, one of the members of the selection committee thought her paintings to be too pessimistic. Uh, her depictions of suffering individuals based on her ex experience of the Holocaust did not agree with the optimistic socialist realist worldview. But anyway, she was admitted and after her degree, she worked until her retirement as an art teacher at the secondary school. And she was also commissioned to make several uh, monuments and memorial plaques that uh, refer to the Holocaust and the Second World War. Now, she's not a known, very well-known artist, so maybe that's why she was not included in Drury's exhibition. I don't know, I still have to ask him. Um, but you can see that her work is most of all important uh, uh, in her uh, attempts to warn people against those uh, dangers of, of uh, Nazism and totalitarianism and uh, also the Holocaust. So here is some of the, uh, another book that she published uh, quite recently. And then you can see on the right hand side, some of her uh, artwork that she made in the 1950s and then a bit later. So let us now return again to Sozansky's work, Rising Above, that you can see here on the left-hand side. This is actually the catalog. So on the left-hand side, you see it, uh, a, a part of it. And let's explore how curator Richard Drury created links between suffering and resistance in the Second World War and in communist Czechoslovakia through his curatorial work. He notes in the catalog that the new permanent exhibition is not a classically conceived presentation of the gallery's collection. Instead of being an encyclopedic sequence of artworks arranged chronologically or stylistically, the exhibition is based on the diverse spectrum of a, pers a person's emotional and mental life. The starting point is provided by thematic pairs, either contradictory or complementary, to which the exhibited works relate, such as joy and grief, or equilibrium and tension, or alienation and meditation. This creates a polemical space between two clearly defined dimensions of the inner life of humanity. The aim of the exhibition is for viewers to understand artistic expression as something that speaks about timelessly relevant aspects of human existence. So Drury does in a way, does in a way collapses time, uh, presenting uh, the works not uh, in a chronological narrative of artistic development, but instead as a mythical story of moral dilemma, freedom, oppression, and justice. And he bases this all on uh, objects, images, and texts that he has gathered from different times and places, and that he has brought together in one exhibition. 
So Drury then, um, Drury displayed Sozansky's work on, under the heading, uh, sorry, I'm clicking, sorry. Drury displayed Sozansky's work under the heading conscience, its opposite theme being resignation. To emphasize the moral dimensions of conscience, the curator presented two quotes alongside the artwork. The first is by the first century Latin writer Publius uh, Cyrus, who said that, I quote, even when there is no law, there is conscience. The second quote is an aphorism by Czech painter and writer uh, Joseph uh, Čapek, who died in concentration camp Bergen-Belsen in 1945. So the quote goes, people observe many cruelties. Some of them are vociferously outraged in the media, others pass over them in silence, tacitly endorsing them. Entitled Conscious of the World, the Adagia refers to the dilemma people face when confronted with violence. Another quote by Chapek and his work Longing, or Toha, uh, from 1939, hangs on the adjacent wall. The quote reaffirms the call for freedom, rights, and justice, and the figure of a woman dressed in the colors of the Czechoslovak flag symbolizes the predicament of the Czech nation when it was threatened by Nazi occupation. So as you can see, she sits in a dark landscape, looking at a disappearing uh, rainbow in the distance. And within months, the world was indeed at war and the Nazis began to plan the extermination of the Jews. And within years, Chapek himself was sent to the ghetto in Terezin and later died in concentration camp Bergen-Belsen. Now framed by these quotes and artworks, Sozansky's visual work poses moral questions about individual responsibility in the light of oppression. And you can see that also here on Sozansky's website. Um, with this quote. Um, the curator Drury strengthened this curatorial message through his selection of artworks and texts placed under the theme resignation. One of the paintings representing two people seated on chairs is a work by Ivan Bukowski, who we have already uh, encountered uh, earlier in the talk. And this is from his um, from a series called Old People's Home, created in 1982. Drury added an interpretative layer, exhibiting a quote by the American historian Timothy Schneider next to Bukowski's work, taken from Schneider's book uh, from 2017 on tyranny. So you see the quote here on the left side uh, in, in, in the cat catalog. Power wants your body softening in your chair and your emotions dissipating on the screen. Get outside, put your body in unfamiliar places with unfamiliar people, make new friends and march with them. So reading this quote while looking at the image of the seated couple um, turns the painting into a visual prompt calling for active resistance against debilitating power structures. So all of this shows that artworks framed within the, within the context of specific exhibitions do not only extend the agency of their makers, such as Sozansky, and the subjects of the works, in the case of the triptych Palach, but also the agency of the curator, and in this case, that is Drury. The effective force of the exhibits, however, is not purely determined by artists and curators. Um, Signification and emotional impact are relational processes in which viewers are not passive receptacles. Their own knowledge, experience, expectations, and indeed ways of seeing influence the affective dynamics. For example, a visitor who knows that Bukowski's Jewish parents met in concentration camp uh, Terezin and survived Auschwitz, Ravensbrück, and Bergen-Belsen will make additional links between the different quotes and works in the whole, and may strongly empathize uh, with the artist and maybe imagine the impact of aggression and violence on families and larger communities. 
So like Drury, who decided against a historical chronology in the exhibition, Sozansky's artistic imagination has moved back and forth in time and across geographical distances. And that happened actually since the start of his career in the 1970s. Over the years, his works and performances have referred to, first of all, time and place specific instances of suffering and resistance, and also secondly, to what he understands as a timeless human condition of inequality and power struggle. While his work, works can of course be dated and listed chronologically, they can also be understood as uh, through a perspective of circular temporality, where previous works appear and reappear in thickening plots. So to conclude, um, the focus on transvision has allowed us to explore artistic articulations of suffering and defiance within changing political contexts. And in the examples, there were clear tensions and shifts between seeing, being seen, looking back, looking across times and spaces, hiding and revealing. There were also competing, changing and interlinking projections of different visions through curatorial framing and censorship. So I believe that the perspective of transvisions as proposed here is a useful tool to unravel all of these complexities. Thank you. Hi. Uh, okay, so thank, thank you. Um, so I would ask those in the audience who have questions or comments to please put them in the Q&A. Uh, and I will uh, share them with our speaker. Um, but I myself will pose the first question, which is um, kind of a question that, that, that um, asks you to wax autobiographical a bit, um, which is how, how, does, how, does, uh, how does one get to Czech art? Um, why? And you've been working on the Czech art for quite some time. Um, how would you argue that people in the West, the so Western Europe, the United States, should why should they um, concern themselves with Czech art? It, it seems, from a certain perspective, that Eastern Europe is so radically different from anything that is understood in the West that it's you know that it's almost um, it's almost arguably impossible for um, a Westerner even to connect to uh, the experiences of Czech people, things like Terezin or, you know, the experience of a student who set himself alight in 1969. These, these seem so, so different from the kind of experiences that West Europeans or West or, or people in, in, in North America have had. So how do you, how do you, how do you, how do you connect uh, and, and make relevant um, the Czech and Czechoslovak case for Western audiences. I mean, how, how, and so I'll will start with that, and I have, I have a few other things that I that I could attach to it, and maybe you could you could also um, explain why the concept of transvision might might be helpful in linking uh, us to to them. Um, mm -hmm. So that that's how I would. Yeah, that's a large question. <laughs> um, well, I think actually that we can think about humanity as uh, you know something that people share <laughs> so the whole perspective the whole idea of conflict and pain and and oppression and resistance is within all of us whether it's about at the level of um, uh, remembering being pushed aside by our brothers or sisters when we were small and getting angry um, of course, that's that's a very minor act of of, of 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 feeling conflict, and it is not really comparable with something as as, as terrible as, as as a war or the Holocaust. Uh, but I think somehow um, we can, the, the, for, at the level of emotions, all people can understand that there is or they have been threatened at some time at at, at some level. Um, and I think also well being I'm half Czech, half Dutch. So um, if we think about the West, I don't know what the West is, <laughs> but certainly um, in Holland, there was also the, the Second World World War also affected us. So um, and there have been uh, 
similar stories of, of, of course, people being sent to concentration camps and, and, and so on. And um, people, maybe other Dutch people, um, siding with the Germans uh, for certain reasons. Uh, so I think these are large issues that uh, do reflect. Um, and I would also say that um, if we think about the Czech, the Czechs as, as some kind of an isolated uh, region or a singular region, that is of course, history, as you know very well, you described it mm -hmm. very well in your own books. Uh, it, that is a yeah, misconception because um, movement has happened throughout history. And uh, uh, yeah, also in terms of art, there has been a lot of um, uh, influence um, back and forth and across the world. Um, so yeah, in that sense, uh, we cannot really think about this as either isolated regions nor as people who are different to us uh, because yeah, we are all emotional beings. So we can empathize uh, and uh, maybe not share a traumatic experience of, 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 uh, of pain and losing uh, people due to war, as of course is happening in Ukraine at the moment, but we can empathize and uh, in that sense get close. And I think art is one way in which uh, um, people can try to understand and feel what uh, uh, other people uh, experience. You've been fascinated with Czech artists for some time. and, and... Um, so this, this uh, Soznansky, did I say his name, Soznansky, mm -hmm. um, is also an artist, I think, that, you, that you've um, been interested in for a long time. And what, 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 what do you find particularly fascinating about the, the Czech art world that uh, you think people outside of the Czech lands, whether you call it the West or, or whatever you call it, what, what is it that um, people elsewhere should be um, uh, should, should find um, particularly instructive maybe uh, about the, uh, the career of a person uh, like this, because this is, this is an artist who has, in, in a sense, lived several lives. We, we don't really have, if you'll excuse the expression again, the West, we don't have this expression in the West of having lived in something like 1968, and then, you know, the so-called normalization period, this time of a, a neo-totalitarianism, and then uh, the time of the early 1990s. I mean, it's almost as though he's lived through three or four lives. So what, what do we learn from an artist who's lived under the, those sorts of circumstances? And what is, what is it that, that brought you to, um, uh, to study these, these, these people so carefully and, 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 you know, with such sensitivity? Yeah, so, so yeah, so first maybe to, to start with why I, I initially got interested. Um, when I started as an anthropologist, I was initially an Africanist, and I my first research was six months in Ghana doing research on the um, on the art market uh, against the background of colonialism and post-colonialism. But then that was so that was in 1989 when I was in Ghana. Of course, then the Velvet Revolution happened, um, and I happened to be a daughter of um, a refugee who left Czechoslovakia in 1948. Uh, who went to Holland and then married my mother, who's Dutch. So as a child, I used to go with my mother. My father, of course, wasn't allowed to go back to um, Czechoslovakia because he was a political refugee. But with my mother, we used to visit um, my grandmother and other relatives. So I have a, yeah, I think I was there for the first time in 1966 or seven as a small child. And then almost every year I would go there. So you would get an idea of what life over there was. And also looking beyond the quite simplistic Cold War image of, oh, they're all suffering and unhappy and crying all the time. Of course, you'd have a great time. Uh, very warm people uh, uh, having drinks. And, you know, uh, some members of the family would be communist party members um, for pragmatic re reasons. Others would be very much against it. So to see this complexity um, was very interesting. And then before I studied anthropology, I have I, I um, went to an art academy in the Netherlands. So I was trained as a painter. So that kind of combined my interest also in, in art. Um, so um, yeah, that's how I 
got interested. And then, of course, as a child of a refugee and being born in the West, if you like, let's use that term. Of course, I did have a, a Cold War perspective when I started my research. So I kind of imagined that I would find um, official artists who were really propagandists and who had no artistic skill whatsoever versus dissidents who were unofficial artists and did all the interesting stuff. Now, when you get there, it's much, it's much more complicated and also taking a historical approach where you follow certain individuals in their career against the background of very of changing political uh, uh, a political climate, of course, with the 1960s and or 50s, 60s, 70s, uh, very different periods. You could see that it was the story was much more complicated than that. And I think that is maybe uh, something that is interesting for all of us. So to what extent politics can shape uh, artistic produ production and, and thought more generally, but also how people push back um, and um, how art can be used to do so. Good. Um, we have a question in, in the Q&A from Rob Kaufman from uh, Rhetoric at Berkeley. Um, writes, many thanks for your tremendous presentation. Is it too soon to know any pos possible effects or entra entrances into Czech discourse and culture these works are generating now? in the midst of the Russian war on Ukraine. Thank you again. Yeah, I actually thought about it when I was preparing the, the lecture. Um, and I recently, actually two weeks ago, I was in Prague. Um, and it's amazing how the Czechs are supporting the Ukrainians. And also visually, you can see when you walk through Prague everywhere, you have flags and official buildings and, uh, and people themselves and little drawings by children that they put in, 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 the, in the windows and so on. So for obvious reasons, this, this whole um, situation with Russia that resonates a lot with the Czechs. And you can also see it in the actual day, the, the support they give um, militarily, but also by taking Ukrainians in. And artists are very active Mm -hmm. um, so they have uh, organized exhibitions and they, um, they sell works and uh, the money goes to, towards um, supporting the Ukra Ukrainian people. So in that sense, you can see it does resonate a lot. And yes, yeah, some Czechs are pretty scared as well about everything that's happening. Um, and maybe transvision is also a good concept here to be thinking about that, where uh, people have embodied experiences that have shaped their outlook on life. And um, of course, when we, when we, we um, try to understand what's happening to us today, we, of course, we draw on past experiences and also emotionally um, on the spheres we felt or the happiness we felt uh, that does shape how we perceive the future. Um, so it's almost like a loop there. Um, and by all by understanding just the past as the past and the present as the present and the future as the future, you will not get to that point. I think that's why the, the whole idea of the, the trans vision, so the movement itself is what uh, is important. Uh, and I kind of got this also from partly uh, transnational the concept of transnationalism, where if you look at migrants, for example, um, and you just look at um, where they live now and where they lived before, and you try to create a conceptual model to understand their experiences and actions, you don't get very far because it is exactly in the movement between where you can understand uh, those migrants. And of course, I'm one of them <laughs> in a way. Good. Well, I hear the bell ringing. Um, uh, maybe that would be a good good moment to bring our session to a conclusion. Um, I want to thank you, Marushka, for your for your talk um, and for um, I should mention uh, helping inaugurate a special relation between UC Berkeley and Queen's University Belfast, which we uh, uh, which will involve uh, exchange of faculty and students over 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 years, and this is one of the first events uh, in, the, in, in this uh, 
uh, what we hope will be a very important relation over time. Okay, so um, please join me in, in offering Rushka a vir virtual uh, round of applause and uh, thanks very much for sharing with us those, those uh, very stirring uh, images from uh, the Czech art world. Um, and with that, I will wish you all a good evening. Uh, yeah, and hope to see many of you in Belfast. It would be great to have you over and your students. Thank you. Yes, good. Okay, so best wishes and bye-bye. <laughs>